Uh, shalom everyone and welcome to Bits of Torah Truths and uh, this week's Parsha is Parashat Va'et Hanan and it's titled, the, the title of the study is Entering into the Presence of God. Okay, and so um, you can find the the study at matsadi.com and I posted the link there in the room. Okay, so in this week's reading from Parashat Va'et Hanan is it covers Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 23 to chapter 7 verse 11 and Moshe asks the Lord if he can go to the promised land and the Lord tells him no and the Lord told him to go up to the town to the top of Pisgah or Pisgah and see the promised land with his own eyes and when we're reading this verse it says look God tells him to look north east south and west and I thought that was interesting because if you're looking north east south and west it's as if you're in the middle of the promised land already right so why why would god tell moshe to to look north east south and west when he's on this side of the jordan you know and could it be that reuben and gad that decision had already been made you know at the end of the numbers that reuben and gad uh had decided to remain on this side so it was already a a, a part of the promised land i don't know but I, I thought that was interesting, you know, look, northeast, south, and west, right? <laughs> so, um, and when I was reading through the Midrash Rabbah, I don't believe the rabbis really said anything about that. They didn't pick up on that. Or maybe they did, and it's written somewhere else, I don't know. But but anyway, um, so Moshe ascends the, to the top of Pisgah, and, and he's, he views the promised land with his own eyes. And he says, he tells the people to keep your soul diligently and to not forget the things the Lord has done so that the testimony the Torah does not depart from your heart all the days of your life and he goes on to say that they teach God's word that they are to teach God's word to their sons and grandsons so they too learn to fear the Lord all the days they live on this earth the Ten Commandments are repeated here in this Parsha and then we are told how Moshe interceded on behalf of the people at the mountain of Sinai. And we are told to obey the Lord, his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, so that the Lord will prosper you. Moshe warns the people who are entering the promised land to tear down the Asherahs, smash the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherim, and burn the graven images with fire and the people have, that the people have set up in Canaan. And then God says that you are a holy people, the Lord God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all peoples who are on the face of the earth. And uh, that's Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 4 through 6. And so at the mountain of Sinai, the people, they feared God, and they asked Moshe to speak for them on their behalf because they were afraid to hear the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire, you know, as we read in the, in the Torah. So they asked Moshe to draw near to hear the word of the Lord and then to bring that word back and they will do what God has commanded. And so the verses we're looking at is in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 27 and 29 on page 1. And it says the following, Go near and hear all that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us all that the Lord our God speaks to you, and we will hear and do it. The Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commands always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. Okay, so that was Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 27 to 29. And in this portion, the scripture, the, the people, this portion of scripture, the people recognize that it's a dangerous thing to enter into the presence of, a, of the living God. And when, by recognizing this, they ask Moses to go and to bring back word because they, they had a fear and respect for, for the Lord. And it might have been more of fear than respect, you know, but... God's response was is that the Lord heard the voice of, their, of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of 
the words of this people, which they have spoken to you, they have done well in all that they have spoken. So God was pleased with what the people had asked, you know, asking for someone to stand in the gap between them and God, and that they, that could bring the message uh, to them. Now God says that this is the type of heart that one is to have, to fear him and to obey his meets vote. And is this action of recognizing the importance and the sanctity of the one whom they draw near to in prayer? And this is a very, very important concept. In Judaism, it's known as Kavana. And according to Rabbi Chaim Halevi Donin, Kavana may be defined in the following way. And um, this was taken from the book to pray as a Jew, okay, and it's on page 18 through 20, if anyone, you know, whoever has that book. But um, it's not expensive either. But um, the definition of Havana, or Kavana, is that the Talmud speaks of the importance of being aware that it is God who is being addressed, to know before whom you are standing. And as found in the Talmud Bavli, Berachot 28b. For example, simply reading from a prayer book does not mean that you are praying. And the Hebrew word for kavana states that he who prays must direct his heart to heaven. And that's found in the Talmud Bavli in Berachot 31a. And without kavana, one is only making a mechanical and prefunctory reading of words. One cannot have kavana when one is in a mood of extreme anger, sorrow, distraught over problems is extreme or is extremely fatigued or when they are uh, they are there are external distractions and so that that's the definition of cabana um, and so um yeah that that's a good book too to to be a Jew and so um and this this book uh, to pray as a Jew is really good it goes through the uh, the synagogue service and everything, and um, I recommend, I recommend the book. I mean, it's a good book. And Ellie says that it has kavana has to do with the intent too and what we do. And I agree. And in the Torah portion, the people were afraid and asked for an intermediary, someone that who would go on their behalf before God, hear the word of the Lord, and then bring that word back to speak and teach what the Lord had said. And this is the general attitude that um, that Rabbi Bahia ben Yosef had towards prayer and drawing near to the Lord. And Rabbi Bahia was he was a Jewish philosopher who lived in Zaragoza, Spain in the first half of the eleventh century. He seemed to be a contemporary with Rashi, you know. Um, and so he wrote a book titled uh, Chovot Halevavot, meaning the duties of the heart, and giving three general categories for Kavana under the heading, The Different Ways of Serving God. And this book is another one of those books you can find online for free. I, I believe you Google scanned it in, and so you can find this, Duties of the Heart. But uh, anyway, so the this in Rabbi Bachia's um, he outlines the different ways of serving God, and it says that duties of uh, duties of one is the duties of the heart alone, which is the subject of his book. Two is the duties of the body and heart together. That these involve prayer, Torah study, praising and glorifying God, teaching wisdom, enjoining right conduct, and warning against evil and the like. And then three is duties of the limbs in which the heart has no part except for initially directing the act towards God. For example, in uh, the sukkah, the, luva, uh, the, the lulav, and tzitzit, the mezuzah is another one, and observing the Shabbat, the festivals, and giving charity, to name a few, are the duties of the limbs. So the topic of prayer in the one whom we draw near to, based upon the Torah portion, has led many written works, has led to many written works in the Jewish thought and practice. And the importance of prayer 
drawing near to the Lord, knowing whom it is that we are standing before, should permeate every area of our daily lives, especially if our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And because of the magnitudes of God's words in Parashat Ve'et Hanan, which this portion that we're studying today, this week, is that what the people were asking for was good and their fear of the Lord. And the rabbis, they pick up on this in Midrash on Devarim Rabbah, on drawing near to the Lord. And so in Midrash Devarim Rabbah, Parashat 2, part 10, they they speak about this, and it says the following, and I'm on page 3 of the study. Rabbi Judah, son of Rabbi Simon, said, You will find that idols are near and yet distant, and the Holy One, blessed be he, is distant and yet near. How are idols near? A heathen makes an idol and places it within, within his house, and that idol, that idol is near unto him. And whence do we know that that very idol is distant? For it is said, Yea, though one cry unto him, he cannot answer nor save him. Thus the idol is dif- distant. And God is distant and yet near. How? Rabbi Judah, son of Simon, said, From here the earth unto heaven is a journey of five hundred years. Hence he is distant. Whence do we know that he is also near? A man stands at prayer and meditates in his heart, and God is near unto his prayer, as it is said, O you that hears prayer, unto you does all flesh come. They quote from Psalm 65. David said before God, Master of the universe, when the nations of the world come to pray before you, do not you do not answer them, for they do not approach you with a perfect heart. But they first appeal to their idol, and when it does not answer them, and they see their sore plight, they approach you. Then do you also not answer them, as it says, They cried, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. They quote from Psalm 18. What is the meaning of, they cried? They cried to their idol, and when they then approached you unto the Lord, but he answered them not. But when Israel came unto you, you hear our prayer immediately, as it is said, Answer me when I call. And they quote from Psalm 4. God said to him, David, you say, answer me when I call, by your life, even before you call, will I answer you, as it is said, before they call, I will answer. And they quote from Isaiah 65, and for I have no other nation but you. Whence do you know this? From what we read in the same context, from what great nation is there that has God so near unto them, as the Lord our God is, whensoever we call upon him. Okay, and that was... That was Midrash Rabbah Devarim, Parashat 2, Part 10. And then um, Parashat 2, Part 2, I also quote from here on page 4. It says, bottom of 3, top of page 4. It says, another explanation, as the Lord our God, there spares out when, what Scripture says, but as for me, let my prayer be unto you in an acceptable time. Rabbi Hananiah, son of Papa, asked Rabbi Samuel, son of Nachman, What is the meaning of the verse? But as for me, let my prayer be unto you in an acceptable time. He replied, The gates of prayer are sometimes open and sometimes closed, but the gates of repentance always remain open. He then asked him, When do you know this? Rabbi Samuel replied, Because it is written, With wondrous works do you answer us in righteousness, O God, our salvation. You the confidence of all the earth, all the ends of the earth, and of the far distant sea. They quote from Psalm 65. And just as the ritual bath is sometimes open and sometimes closed, so too the gates of prayer are sometimes open and sometimes closed. But as the sea ever remains open, so is the hand of God ever open to receive the penitent. And Rabbi Annan said the gates of prayer also are never closed, for it is written, As the Lord our God is whenever we call upon him, and calling is nothing else but prayer, as Scripture in another context has it, and it will come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And Rabbi Chaya, the elder, said, It is written, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yea, wait you for the Lord. Pray and pray again, and you may light upon the hour when your prayer will be answered. Another explanation, but as for me, let my prayer, etc., and David, because he prayed as an individual, said in an acceptable time, 
but the prayer of a community never remains unanswered. This is the force of the expression, as the Lord our God is whenever we call upon Him. Okay, so that was from Midrash Rabbah. And in Midrash Rabbah Devarim Parashat 2, Part 10, a discussion proceeds. The rabbis, they, they say that uh, they, they discuss these idols and, and prayer and God, and they drawing near and yet the idols drawing near and yet being far away, whereas the Lord God Almighty is far away but yet is near. And the question is asked about the idol being near. The heathen makes an idol, places it within his house. The idol is near. It is also distant because the heathen pray and it doesn't answer them. And the Lord God, on the other hand, is distant but yet near because the man who prays, the Lord is near him. The idea is that when one prays, one is standing in the presence of God. Okay, and that's what we get out of the Midrash and out of Scripture. And the nations do not hear from God because they do not approach the Lord with a perfect heart or in the way or the manner in which God has designed what 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 the Lord wants. In part two of Midrash Rabba Devarim Parashat 2, the Midrash speaks of the gates of prayer being open or closed, whereas the gates of repentance are always open, and a parallel is drawn to the mikvah, the ritual bath, being open and closed, to the gates of prayer being open and closed. And you know, I thought it was interesting that they would mention that the, the mikvahs, or the mikvah, mikvah ot in Jerusalem around the temple would be open or closed. You know, I don't know if that is what happened or what you know they had certain hours of operation right <laughs> that you could go in and um perform a mikvah i don't know but i thought that was an interesting um interesting point that they're drawing out here but um it could be that they're just trying to illustrate homiletically this point on prayer and uh and going before god but the ritual bath is understood to be synonymous with repentance. We know that. And it's always open because the sea can be used as a valid mikvah to receive the penitent. Rabbi Annan disagrees with the previous conclusions and states that the gates of prayer are always open because the Lord God is at, the, at every place that we call upon his name in prayer, drawing the conclusion that when one prays, he or she is standing in the presence of God. And the obvious conclusion based upon the Midrash is that drawing near to speak to the Lord is possible only for the penitent, for the, the humble, the innocent, for those who seek the Lord with a pure heart. And so the point of this week's Torah study, and because we've looked at a lot of rabbinic material, you know, and um the rabbinic tradition and even mentioning kavana and the point of the study is that not it is not to get everyone every person reading this torah commentary to begin praying as a jew you know i mean that that's not the point and the point is in the use of the commentary is that the rabbinic tradition contained within the Jewish commentaries from the Midrashim, the Talmud, the Mishnah, etc., are all meant to facilitate a deeper discussion regarding our faith and who we are in Christ, in the Messiah. Take, for example, the topic of Havana, Kavana, and prayer. We can ask ourselves the following questions. What does my prayer life look like today? Am I doing what the Lord wants me to do? to humble myself and pray? Am I holding the proper respect and reverence for the Lord when I go before Him in prayer? Or am I even spending enough time praying each day? Like an hour, 30 minutes, even 15 minutes? Am I even praying 15 minutes a day? And I've run into quite a few people that, I mean, they even unsubscribe from the mailing list because mentioning the rabbis okay and what happens is that as soon as the rabbis are mentioned there's a knee-jerk reaction that um and the idea that one gets upset because oh you're studying the rabbis the rabbinic you know you know stuff like that and uh they say that we are supposed to only study the bible only study the bible which is solified or you know sola scripture 
or um, that we only need the New Testament. I've run into people like that too. And the point and the importance of this topic this week is that um, it's possible to understand Judaism and the Jewish literature, the, the Midrashim, the Talmud, the Mishnah, etc., all within the framework of the teachings of Yeshua the Messiah and the disciples, according to the Gospels and the Apostolic Writings, in a way that is not in contradiction to who Yeshua is, the Messiah of God. You know, I, I believe that it's completely possible. And especially when we study the rabbinic literature in the Talmud, the Mishnah, and the, the Midrash, that we find that, and even in this, in the Midrash that we mentioned here, that one rabbi has one opinion, another one has another. You know, the, a lot of times they'll take opposing views solely or strictly for the purpose and the intent to help us to think more deeply on a topic. And that, that's the point of, um, that's the point that I try to get out of the rabbinic literature, is to try to understand our faith in a different way. And, but not so different that it contradicts who Yeshua is as the Messiah. I don't think that's even necessary to go that far because Yeshua is the Messiah and he can he fits right here within Judaism, right within the uh, within the lines of of what we find within the rabbinic literature, and and so but um, the our goal should be that when we when we study these scriptures and the rabbinic literature, it should be to deepen our faith and our relationship with the Lord and to draw nearer to Him while learning more about His Word, you know, the Bible. And we can also learn a lot while trying to understand first century Judaism culturally, rabbinically, and because many things the rabbis say actually shed some light on some of the discussions that Yeshua had with the Pharisees in the Gospels. And it's just like the example of Netalat, Net, Netalat Yadayim, which is the wa ceremonial washing of our hands. You can find that even in the Siddur at the back, in you know, the rules for you know, when we, we go before God. And it was meant to, do, to be as something that was in, in prayer, as uh, to go before God clean. You know, we wash our hands with that kind of intent. And, um, and so, but as the children of God, we should get very excited about these things and we should be actively engaged in studying and searching the scriptures with confidence and the hope that we have in Yeshua who is the Messiah of God. And when studying the rabbinic commentaries, this, these, these rabbinic commentaries help to add a new dimension to the context of the scriptures. The rabbis during the Talmudic period wrote extensively using Midrash in their study of the Torah and the Psalms, and examining the rabbinic thought process can actually help us to think more deeply about our own faith and our walk before God in the Messiah. And in the Torah portion, the people recognized the meaning of entering into the presence of the living God and hearing His words. Do we have now I'll read that again. In the Torah portion, the people recognized the meaning of entering into the presence of the living God and hearing his words because they were they feared God. They wanted Moses to go and hear and bring that word back. And the question is, do we have that same sense of sanctity today when we pray? The Lord said, it is good what the people are asking because they have humble hearts, they fear him, and this will cause them to come to him with kavana. Do we have the proper kavana when we pray today? Do we have the proper respect for who he is? Do you really believe that you're entering into the presence of the Most High God when you call upon our Father in heaven in the name of his Son, Yeshua the Messiah? And we've read and heard it said that there is power in the name of Yeshua. But do we really believe in the power and the sanctity of that name? And I think this is this is serious food for thought, you know. And so that concludes the Torah study for uh this week and uh, I'll release the mic for anyone who has any comments.